All right, welcome back. We continue. Bob Pompiani, Andrew Filipponi with you tonight. Pony, my thing is I want to see them healthy at the end of the year. That's the number one thing. But you can't predict a lot of that. Even if you're on a pitch count, things can happen. Vis-a-vis -vis George Pickens, however he got that, it can happen in practice. So I'm trying to get what I can get because I still think it's attainable watching Kansas City. Um, I know who they are. I know what they've done. But I also think if you win this game somehow, uh, and then you go to Baltimore, and who knows, they've had success down there. All of a sudden, you're setting up a Christmas Day miracle, potentially, for a number one seed. Yeah, but like you just said, though, if the main goal is to stay healthy, if you play these guys maximum intensity all out, you might not they have done them that. healthy. They haven't done that anyway. Look at their snap totals the last few games. I well, then, well, then why the are you well, then, you're, th then we're arguing the same point then, because I'm saying reduce their workload but, in this game. But if you, you were saying that... If you dis no, I, I'm saying that I still want to go all out and win as best I can. That does not mean well, that even in games earlier, they weren't playing 90% of the snaps. That's just the way he does business, and I think it's a good way to do business with veteran Well, TJ Watt is. I disagree I'm with you on about that. TJ Watt absolutely I'm is. I'm talking well, about guys like Cam who are older than TJ Watt. Well, TJ Watt wasn't in the playoff game last year, so attrition is a real thing. And for me, but you can't if predict we don't when it's going to happen either, though. You can't okay, say well just that, because your workload is intense, that means you're going to get injured. You could get injured running out to the field and hit a divot in the field. Who knows? I don't know. That's all. Okay. I'm well, I, then, well, well, right. But if I went out, if, if I went out and tried to run nine miles without training versus trying to walk a mile, I might pass out on a nine-mile run. I'm not on a one-mile walk. It's, it, it's, there are different levels here. A practice walkthrough is not the same thing as trying to win a game in Philadelphia. If it's, if it's not a big deal, then why have we complained for months about having to play these three games back to back to back? If it's not, if it's not going to take a lot out of them or wear them down, th then why have we complained about my it for biggest, so long, My Bob? complaint was not about the three games in 11 days. My complaint was shoving so many important games all together. And I think they did that for television purposes. Anyway, we could sit here all night and talk about it. I think I agree. With my, you see, my thing is, if you lose this week and then you should lose to Baltimore, you're setting it, yourself up to lose the division. you got to win these games when you have a chance. That's my only point. But all you need to do is beat Baltimore. What you do against Philly has nothing to do about, with the division. But I also talk about a number one seed because I think Kansas City could slip out. they got the Texans, same day as the Steelers play on Christmas Day. I think that could be, you never know. I, and I don't want to. I don't want to pre predict that they're going to just win every game because they're not. And I suspect the Kansas City Chiefs won't make the Super Bowl because I haven't seen enough from them. I know what they are. I know what Patrick Mahomes is, but to me, they're not the same Kansas City team. I, maybe they're running out of gas. Speaking of long opportunities to be so successful year after year after year. But anyway, let's go to Alliance, Andrew. I got a lot of people I want to get them on. We'll okay. begin here with um, Darnell, or is it Daryl? Daryl and Cranberry. What's up, Daryl? Hey, guys, thanks for taking my call. This is about the Pickens situation, and I'm just curious. It seems, you know, the last little bit, he came on as a game-time decision with a hamstring. Could this be more about that as it is maybe Tomlin sending a message to him no. about his unsportsmanlike penalties and something bigger than what we know about? I'll hang no, up I would say no to that. And I think it, it seems like it would be an awfully uh, protracted way of going about doing this to carry out what you think is discipline. Because he was trying out in the game. It wasn't like he was just not around. He was. So I, I, I think this is far too serious to be worrying about whether or not it's discipline. I think some people thought that at the beginning, Andrew, and I understood why. But not, not, not if this is going to carry on for a few weeks, no. Well, I heard Mike Tomlin's timeline today on it. I didn't think he was lying or, or, or misleading or being dishonest. But I do think it's odd that they would wait so long to have an MRI. If the player was complaining about hamstring uh, pain or hamstring discomfort, why not immediately do that, the MRI just so you know what you're dealing with? So you can actually get an image and say, okay, this is either a minor thing or a major thing. Instead of just basing it on the player's description of symptoms, actually get something that's black or black and white. And that's why I thought it was just, why, why put that off? I mean, he could have, tr I mean, Bob, it's possible if he went out and warmed up, it's a partial tear. He might have completely torn the thing. True. Sunday morning. That was, that's not out of the question. So. True. I just thought that was a bad job by the Steelers medical staff to wait so long to get that MRI if we take Tomlin at his word. 
Yeah, but I also think those guys are very good at what they do. I don't, you know, who knows how this was, or maybe he downplayed at Pickens, and they said they're just going to see, and you're right. The only way you know anymore is get an MRI, and they waited till Monday to do it. Let's go out to Fred in North Huntington. Hello, Fred. How are you? Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my call. Mm -hmm. oh, appreciate it, Andrew. Hey, I want to talk about the Penguins a little bit. I, I know Bob, Dick, uh, Crosby, Malcolm, and, uh, you know, those guys have done a lot for us. But it's been seven years now. I mean, this is getting a little bit ridiculous. They're not going to make the playoffs again this year. Anybody that thinks that is, is living a dream. They're living a, living a pipe dream. This is not a good organization anymore. There is no easy fix for this. They're not going to make the playoffs. Well, they doubled down on what they were doing, you know, and they put themselves in this situation, Andrew. So it's the Fenway Sports Group. It's Kyle Dubas. It's Mike Sullivan all wanting what they all wanted. And now you're in a situation, and I'm not blaming them. They're still good players. The problem is they're older, and if you're relying on them to give you the same production you did four or five years well, ago, you're not going to get it. Plus, I think some of these contracts that were brought in by Kyle Dubas have backfired massively, and I think that has a lot to do yeah. with it, too. I'm going to blame him for some things. I mean, uh, I'm not going to blame him as much for keeping Sid, Malkin, and Latang because I think all those guys have still played pretty well. I'm going to blame him for the guys that they kept or brought in to fill in around those guys. Uh, keeping Tristan Jari inside under that contract. The Eric Carlson deal to make him the highest paid player on the team. The Ryan Graves contract yeah. where the Penguins are actually a better team when he's out of the lineup than when he's in it. These are all things you had choices to make. Your hands weren't tied by those three player contracts. They had the potential to go out and put really good players around those guys, and they just failed miserably at that, and that's why they are in the quandary that they're in right now. Let's go out to Chuck in Uniontown. Hello, Chuck. How are you? Yeah, well, first of all, Bob, congratulations, congratulations on your latest reward. Oh, so, at Point Park, you mean? You yeah. Well, I mean, I'm looking forward to helping kids is what we're trying to do there, Chuck, but thank you. Oh, okay. But, but as far as Derek Shelton is concerned, I'm from Missouri. you got to show me. <laughs> Talking about is one thing, doing it is another. We know, we all know how the Pirates have been so good at backing up what they say. <laughs> Chuck Dagger right there, and he's right. And you heard, uh, Pony, what Shelton said down there. I understand why he'd be optimistic about his pitching staff. However, it takes more than just a pitching staff, as we've seen. And they need bats. they got to go out. And there's a kind of rumor speculation about Anthony Rizzo. There are some names out there. I think Nolan Arenado wanted to be traded, but he has a list that doesn't include the Pirates, apparently. I mean, they got to sign people, period, I think. Well, let's also, cut, let's also uh, hone in on the pitching comment. He said, we've got a great pitching staff. No, you don't. You've got one great pitcher, and you've got two guys in Jared Jones and Mitch Keller who pitched really well for about half the season, and then both of them fell apart. Jones got hurt, and then Keller blew up in the second half of the season for the second consecutive year. Uh, Luis Ortiz, I thought, overachieved. He had a really good season. Bailey Falter is what he is, and you're getting Johan Oviedo back. So it's not a bad pitching staff, but they're nowhere close to an elite pitching staff based on how last year ended. And oh, by the way, Bob, part of your pitching staff is your bullpen. Right. right what is right. your bullpen situation for this year? Holderman stunk last season. Bednar had a career worst season. Your best relief pitcher was probably Santana, who you got from the Yankees. And who knows if he's going to be able to repeat what he did with the Pirates. I don't know. I don't think that their pitching staff is as good as he's making it out to Well, me. I would say starters potentially could be the strength of the team which is opposite what we thought last year when the bullpen was supposed to be it. But anyway, uh, Chuck, before we go to break, you got your wish. The Pirates just made a trade for a first baseman. We'll tell you the details when we come back. Uh, he played in the league last year, hit 12 home runs. Who is he? We'll reveal that name right here after the break on KDK Plus and 93.7 The Fan. Spencer Horwitz, Andrew, is the newest Pirate. He played last year with Toronto. He's a first baseman who had 265, 12 home runs, a 790 OPS. He's 27 years old. In exchange, it's part of a three-way complicated deal, but the Pirates are going to give up Luis Ortiz, who pitched well from last year, Josh Hardo, who currently is ranked 17th in their system, and Michael Kennedy. Spencer Horwitz is going to be their first baseman, it looks like. Your thoughts? Well, the guy did put up good numbers last year. He is a late bloomer. I think he's 27 years old. Mm -hmm. Yep. So he's a guy that had been in the minor leagues for a while and did put up good numbers in the minor leagues. 
and apparently maybe was never viewed as a top prospect, and that's why it took him longer to get to the big leagues. But he was a productive player on a bad Blue Jays team last year, Bob. He also has a relationship, I think, with the Pirates' new hitting coach, Matt Haig. So maybe that had some influence, too, right. on this deal. But I do not like giving up Luis Ortiz. I thought he was such an asset for the Pirates because he could give you bullpen, depth, and starting pitching. So yeah, we'll see. I totally agree with what you just said there. But, hey,